everyone. Hope you're doing well. And today I'm coming to you in this amazing rainbow sweater that I'm like obsessed with. <laughs> uh, it's like comfy and it's rainbow. So those are really my only qualifications. So today we're going to be delving into the world of Egypt and it's wonderful mythology. In the last video, we read the first story in this book, and it was like the creation myth. So, the creation myth is like something that exists in every civilization. Because people are naturally curious um, about how they got here and how the world was created and um, usually these stories are formed because people are watching their environments and kind of like coming to conclusions that make the most sense at that time with the knowledge that they have so um, legend is called the legend of the destruction of mankind. It's interesting that this is right after the creation myth, you know? So we just get it all out of the way. It started, it ended. The text containing the legend of the destruction of mankind is written in hieroglyphs and is found on the four walls of a small chamber which is entered from the hall of columns in the tomb of Seti I, which is situated on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes. On the wall facing the door of this chamber is painted in red the figure of the large cow of heaven. The lower part of her belly is decorated with a series of 13 stars, and immediately beneath it are the two boats of Ra, called Semketet and Men. Tiket, or Sektet and Matet. Each of her four legs is held in position by two gods, and the god Shu, with outstretched, uplifted arms, supports her body. The cow was published by Champollion without the text. The most important mythological text was first published and translated by Professor E. Naville in 1874. It was republished by Bergman and Brugsch, who gave it a transcription of the text with the German translation. Other German versions by Loth Bruxch and Weidman, Weidman have appeared, and a part of the text was translated into French by Lefebvre. The latest edition of the text was published by Lefebvre, and text of a second copy very much mutilated and published by Professor Neville, with a French translation in 1885. The text printed in this volume is that of M. The legend takes us back to the time when the gods of Egypt went about in the country and mingled with men and were thoroughly acquainted with their desires and needs. The king who reigned over Egypt was Ra, the sun god, who is not, however, the first of the dynasty of gods who ruled the land. His predecessor on the throne was Hef Hephaestus, Hephaestus, 
a lot of these are not going to be pronounced right. I'm really sorry. Who, according to Manitho, reigned 9,000 years, whilst Ra reigned only 992 years. So, you know, big difference. Panodorus makes his reign to have lasted less than 100 years. Be this as it may, it seems that the self-created and self-begotten god Ra has been ruling over mankind for a very long time. For his subjects were murmuring against him, and they were complaining that he was old, that his bones were like silver, his body like gold, and his hair like lapis lazuli. Does that have like a... I, I don't know what that I don't know what that means. There's no like explanation or anything. When Ra heard these murmurings, he ordered his bodyguard to summon all the gods who had been with him in the primeval world ocean, and to bid them privately to assemble in the great house, which can be no other than the famous temple of Heliopolis. 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 Why can't I say that? I know that name. Okay. which can be no other than the famous temple of Heliopolis. This statement is interesting, for it proves that the legend is of Heliopolitan origin, like the cult of Ra itself, and that it does not belong, at least in so far as it applies to Ra, to the pre-dynastic period. When Ra entered the great temple, the gods made obeisance to him and took up their position obeisance to him well I don't know what that means either <laughs> and took up their positions on each side of him and informed him that they awaited his words addressing new the personification of the world ocean Ra bade them to take notice of the fact that the men and women whom his eye had created were murmuring against him oh, God. He then asked them to consider the matter and to devise a plan of action for him. For he was unwilling to slay the rebels without hearing what his gods had to say. In reply, the gods advised Ra to send forth his eye to destroy the blasphemers. Like Ra, the eye, Horus? Are they talking about, because they're talking about his eye. For there was no eye on earth that could resist it, especially when it took the form of the goddess Hathor. What? I... This is like... Pretty crazy. I haven't read this book in a while. Hmm. Ra accepted their advice and sent forth his eye in the form of Hathor to destroy them. And though the rebels had fled to the mountains in fear, the eye pursued them and overtook them and destroyed them. Hathor rejoiced in her work of destruction and on her return was praised by Ra for what she had done. The slaughter of men began at Sutan Henan, Heracleopolis, and during the night Hathor weighed about, waited about in the blood of men. Ra asserted his intention of being master of the rebels, and this is probably referred to in the Book of the Dead, chapter 17, XVII, 17, in which it is said that Ra rose as king for the first time in Seton Henan. Osiris also was crowned at Seton Henan, and in this city lived the great Benu bird, or phoenix, and the crusher of bones mentioned in the negative confession. God. The legend now goes on to describe an act of Ra, the significance of which it is difficult to explain. 
But God ordered messengers to be brought to him, and when they arrived, he commanded them to run like the wind to Abu, or the city of Elephantine, and to bring him large quantities of the fruit called Tatat. What kind of fruit this was was not clear, but Bruksh thought that they were mandrakes, the so-called love apples, and this translation of ta tat may be used provisionally. The mandrakes were given to the Sekti, a goddess of Heliopolis, to crush and grind up, and when this was done, they were mixed with human blood and put in a large brewing of beer, which the women slaves had made from wheat. Women slaves. Come on, ancient Egypt. Come on. Silly. In all they made, 7,000 vessels of beer. When Ra saw the beer, he approved of it and ordered it to be carried up the river to where the goddess Hathor was still, it seems, engaged in slaughtering men. Jesus. During the night, he caused this beer to be poured out into the meadows of the four heavens, and when Hathor came, she saw the beer with human blood and mandrakes in it and drank of it and became drunk and paid no further attention to men and women. In welcoming the goddess, Ra called her Amit, or Beautiful One, and from this time onward, beautiful women were found in the city of Amit, which was situated in the western delta near Lake Mariotis. Mariotis. Ra also ordered that in the future, every one of his festival's vessels of sleep-producing beer should be made and that their number should be the same as the number of the handmaidens of Ra. Those who took part in these festivals of Hathor and Ra drank beer in very large quantities and under the influence of the beautiful women or the priestesses who were supposed to resemble Hathor in their physical attractions, the festal celebrations degenerated into drunken and licentious worship. Oh my god, there's so many words in here. <laughs> Um, the festal celebrations degenerated into drunken and licentious orgies. It's pretty, actually pretty common. Like, there's a lot of, like, sexual elements in, like, super early um, ancient civilization myth. And that makes sense, right? Because that's pretty much what we're here for, is to reproduce. And we've kind of, like, made sex this, like, embarrassing, shameful thing. And it's like, they didn't even care. They were just like, we're all going to do it. Because no one's judging us if we're all doing it, right? It's not a bad idea, right, guys? You shouldn't be ashamed, though. Soon after this, Ra complained that he was smitten with pain and that he was weary of the children of men. He thought them a worthless remnant and wished that more of them had been slain. The gods about him begged him to endure and reminded him that this power was in proportion to his will. Ra was, however, unconsoled and he complained that his limbs were weak for the first time in his life. Thereupon, the god of Nu told Shu to help Ra, and he ordered Nut to take the great god Ra on her back. Nut is the sky. Nut changed herself into a cow, and with the help of Shu, Ra got on her back. As soon as men saw that Ra was on the back of the cow of the heaven, of heaven, and was about to leave them, they became filled with fear. And repentance and cried out to Ra to remain with them and to slay all those who had blas blasphemed blasphemed against them but the cow moved on her way and carried Ra to Het Ahit Het Ahit a town in the gnome of 
Marcotus, where in later days the right leg of Osiris was said to be preserved. Oh my god, that's so cool. Because of like the myth of Osiris and how his body was cut up into different pieces and then um, Isis had to like find them and put them back together. Wow, that's cool. Meanwhile, darkness covered the land. When day broke, the men who had repented of their blasphemies appeared with their bows and slew the enemies of Ra. At this result, Ra was pleased, and he forgave those who repented because of their righteous slaughter of his enemies. From this time onward, human sacrifices were offered up at the festivals of Ra celebrated in this place and at Heliopolis and other parts of Egypt. Ooh, human sacrifice. <laughs> After these things, Ra declared to Nut that he intended to leave this world and ascend into heaven, and that all those who would see his face must follow him thither. Then he went up to heaven and prepared a place to which all might come. Then he said, Hetep Seket Ah, or let a great field be produced. And straight away, Seket Hetep, or the field of peace, came into being. Seket Hetep was the Elysian fields of the Egyptians, and the fields of reeds was a well-known section of it. Another command of the god Ra resulted in the creation of the stars, which the legend compares to flowers. Then the goddess Nut trembled in all of her body, and Ra, fearing that she might fall, caused to come into being the four pillars on which the heavens were supported. Turning to Shu, Ra entreated him to protect these supports and to place himself under Nut and to hold her up in position with his hands. Thus Shu became the new sun god in the place of Ra, and the heavens in which Ra lived were supported and placed beyond the risk of falling, and mankind would live and rejoice in the light of the new sun. Oh my God, this is like fascinating. <laughs> At this place in the legend, a text is inserted called the Chapter of the Cow. It describes how the cow of heaven and the two boats of the sun shall be painted and gives the positions of the gods who stand by the legs of the cow and a number of short magical names or formulae which are inexpli inexplicable. The general meaning of the picture of the cow is quite clear. The cow represents the sky in which the boats of Ra sail and her four legs are the four cardinal points which cannot be changed. The region above her back is the heaven in which Ra reigns over the beings who pass there to from this earth. Then they die, and here was situated the home of the gods and the celestial spirits who govern this world. When Ra had made a heaven for himself and had arranged for his continuance of life on earth and the welfare of welfare of human beings, he remembered at one time when reigning on earth that he had been bitten by a serpent and had nearly lost his life through the bite. Fearing that the same calamity might befall his successor, he determined to take steps to destroy the power of all noxious reptiles and dwelt, that dwelt on earth. With this object in view, he told Bath to summon Keb, the earth god, to his presence and this god having arrived, Ra told him that war must be made against the serpents that dwelt in his dominion. Jeez, just leave him alone. He further commanded him to go to the god Nu and to tell him to set a watch over all the reptiles that were in the earth and in the water and to draw up a writing for every place in which serpents are known to be, containing strict orders that they are to bite no one. <laughs> Oh my god, that is adorable. <laughs> Though these serpents knew that Ra was retiring from the earth, they were never to forget that his rays would fall upon them. 
In his place, their father Keb was to keep watch over them, and he was their father forever. As a further protection against them, Ra promised to impart to magicians and snake charmers the particular word of power, Heku, Hekau, Hekau, Heku, with which he guarded himself against the attacks of serpents and also to transmit it to his son Osiris. Thus those who are ready to listen to the formulae of the snake charmers shall always be immune from the bites of serpents and their children also. From this we may gather that the profession of the snake charmer is very ancient and that this class of magicians were supposed to owe the foundation of their craft to a decree of Ra himself. Oh my god, I did not know that. That is... What? Snake charming came about because of this legend of Ra and the serpents. <sighs> Ra next sent for the god Thoth, and when he came into the presence of Ra, he invited him to go with him to a distant, to a distance, to a place called Tuat, i.e. hell or the other world, in which region he had determined to make his light to shine. When they arrived there, he told Thoth, the scribe of truth, to write down on his tablets the names of all those who were therein and to punish those among them who had sinned against him. And he deputed to Thoth the power of to deal absolutely as he pleased with all the beings in the Tuat. Ra loathed the wicked and wished them to be kept at a distance from him. Thoth was to be his vicar to fill his place, and place of Ra was to be his name. He gave him power to send out a messenger, Hab, so the ibis, hobby, came into being. All that Thoth would do would be good. When the word for that is kin. Therefore the techni bird of Thoth came into being. He gave Thoth the power to embrace the heavens. Therefore the moon god, Ah, came into being. He gave Thoth power to turn back, Anun. The northern peoples, therefore the dog-headed ape of Thoth came into being. Finally, Ra told Thoth that he would take his place in the sight of all those who were wont to worship Ra. That is the most confusing sentence. Finally, Ra told Thoth that he would take his place in the sight of all those who were wont to worship Ra, and that all should praise him as God. Thus, the abdication of Ra was complete. In the fragmentary texts which follow, we are told how a man may benefit from the recital of this legend. He must proclaim that the soul which animated Ra was the soul of the aged one, and that of Shu, and then he must proclaim that he is Ra himself and his word of power, Heka. If he recites the chapter correctly, he shall have life in the other world, and he will be held in greater fear there than here. A rubric adds that he must be dressed in new linen garments and be well washed with Nile water. He must wear white sandals and his body must be anointed with holy oil. He must burn incense in a censer and a figure of Mat, the goddess of truth, must be painted on his tongue with green paint. These regulations applied to the laity as well as to the clergy. So that's the second legend of the Egyptian gods. Um, I found that intriguing and I learned a few things about Egypt, which I always enjoy. So I hope everyone got to relax and maybe even learn a few things. 
and I hope you have a great night or day. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video.